Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Old Sarge Collects. My name is Dan, and this is episode 22 of the Diamond Stars set. So let's quickly recap episode 21. In it, we covered card number 80, Louis Chioza. We also talked about card number 81, Bill Delancey. That one was also a Lionel Carter collection card. Uh, we also discussed John Babbage, card number 82. And we finished up with card number 83, the Hall of Famer Paul Wehner. Also happens to be one of my favorite cards in the set. So I've got an interesting lineup for you this week. None of the players are Hall of Famers. However, I think each one of them has a very unique story. So let's go ahead and talk about the first one. And that's card number 84 in the uh, numerical order. And that's Sam Bird. So Sam Bird, Bird holds a distinction of being the only player in Major League Baseball history to um, compete in a Masters and also a World Series. So um, talking a little bit about Sam Bird, he was born in 1906 in Bremen, Georgia. Uh, he was a professional baseball player and a professional golfer. He made his Major League debut in 1929 as an outfielder for the New York Yankees. For most of his time with the Yankees, he served as a backup outfielder and pinch hitter. He made one appearance in the 1932 World Series, filling in for Babe Ruth. And uh, Major League Baseball uh, talks about him being the Moonlight Graham of the World Series because um, when he was filling in for Babe Ruth in the outfield, uh, nothing ever went his way, and then he had one at bat. So kind of an interesting history there. For most of his time with the Yankees, he served as a backup outfielder and pinch hitter. Sam Bird was often called the uh, Babe Ruth's legs in reference to the fact that he often would appear as a pinch runner and defensive replacement for Ruth at the end of games towards the later part of Ruth's career. Uh, Sam made his professional golf debut in 1933. After the 1934 season, he was sold to the Cincinnati Reds. Sam Bird uh, was the starting outfielder for the, first, uh, for the first time in his Major League career in 1935, he played as a starting outfielder for all of the 1935 season. After the 1935 season ended, he returned to a reserve role. Sam Bird played for Cincinnati in the 1936 season, but once the season ended, he was sent down to the minor leagues. In 1937, he announced that he was going to retire from baseball to focus more on his golf career. In 1941... Sam placed third in the 1941 Masters Tournament. He finished in fourth place in the 1942 Masters Tournament. Bird lost the final of the 1945 PGA Championship 4-3 and three in match play. Sam hosted the 1947 PGA Championship and also played in the 1948 Masters Tournament. He retired from the PGA Tour in 1949. In total, Sam Bird won six PGA Tours and many other wins during his time as a professional golfer. He also played in six U.S. Opens during his career. Sam Bird was inducted into the Al Alabama Sports Hall of Fame for his accomplishments in both baseball and golf, and then he died at the age of 74 in 1981. Now let's talk about the card. And um, so the let's talk about the back of the card first. It's a green back. Uh, from 1935, but it gives gives the 1934 averages. And um, the back of the card talks about Sam being a professional golfer and ties that in ties that into his swing of the bat. It says that a batter needs to have a relaxed stance so that you can get a perfect play in the muscles and greater power behind your drives. And uh, the front of the card has Sam in the front of the card in his red... Uh, Cincinnati Reds pinstripes, uh, which I really like. Pinstripes always show up really nicely in these cards. And then it's just got some um, Art Deco style colors, just a mix match of different colors and lines and, and things like that. So uh, kind of a plain card, but still attractive nonetheless. So let's talk about the next player. And that card is of card number 85, Julius Salters. And so let's move him into position and talk about Julius Salters. So don't have much to say about him. Um, he His full name is Julius Moose Salters, 
And in some of his cards, he's actually referred to as Moose. Uh, he made his major league, I'm sorry, he was born in 1906 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He made his major league debut in 1934 as a left fielder for the Boston Red Sox. Soldiers played nine seasons in the American League. He played for four different teams, the Boston Red Sox, <clears throat> the St. Louis Browns, the Cleveland Indians. He went back to the St. Louis Browns, and he finished up his career with the Chicago White Sox. On August 2, 1941, Soldiers was struck in the head by a baseball. The thrown ball fractured his skull and has been attributed to his going blind two years later and ending his career in 1943. So here in a little bit, I'm, I'm actually going to talk about a different player uh, who was struck in the head. But in his case, in, in Julius Solter's case, um, he went blind as a result of being struck in the head. And uh, Julius Solter's died in 1975 at the age of 69. So let's look at the card. Like I said, that was all I had to say about the about Julius Solter's. Now the back of the card is a blue back. It's from 1936 and it gives the 1935 statistics. And the back of the card suggests that Salters will be a great home run hitter due to his size and power. It says that his size is deceptive in the outfield, making him both fast and great and a great fly catcher. And the <clears throat> the front of the card it shows Julius uh, playing for the St. Louis Browns, and it and this would have been his first year on the Browns um, after uh, the Red Sox, and uh, so it shows you know that St. Louis Browns uniform, which I actually like. Um, anyway, he's uh, leaning down, he's running into a ball, looks like to to field a, a, a pop fly or something. You can see the the back wall of, in the outfield. What I really love about this card is. This is one of only a couple of cards in the whole set where you see fans. And in this case, you see fans in the outfield. Find that to be a really interesting, um, uh, you know, artist take on, on this picture. And then you've got a, a pennant flying here. So really love this image. Uh, it's kind of one of those in-action poses. So, All right, so that was Julius Salters. Now the next player is going to be card number 86, and that is of Frank Crescetti. Frank Crescetti's got a very interesting career as well. Um, so let's talk about Frank Crescetti, if I can say his name right. Uh, he was born in 1910 in San Francisco, California. He made his major league debut in 1932 as a shortstop for the New York Yankees. Crescetti grew up in the, New in, in the North Beach area of San Francisco, the same area as Tony Lazari and the DiMaggio brothers. Before joining the Yankees, Crescetti also played four seasons with the San Francisco Seals of the Pacific Coast League, very much like Joe DiMaggio. Uh, Crescetti joined the Yankees in 1932, just in time to play in the 1932 World Series against the Chicago Cubs. Crescetti was selected for the All-Stars in 1936, and for the second time in his career, he went to the World Series. This time, the Yankees beat the New York Giants. Frank Cassetti was also uh, was was the AL stolen base leader in 1938 and was selected for the All Star second time to the All Star game in 1939. Now, after a poor 1940 season, he lost the starting shortstop job to Phil Rizzuto in 1941. And as you know, Phil Rizzuto is a Hall of Famer. He was briefly given back the position while Rizzuto was in the Navy during World War II. But once Rizzuto rejoined the club in 1946, uh, Crescetti then became a player coach for the club through the 1948 season. Frank Crescetti earned eight World Series rings as a player with the New York Yankees. After the 1948 season, Crescetti continued on as a coach with the Yankees, where he would earn nine more World Series rings with the franchise. So this is a total of 17 World Series rings. That's four more than Yogi Berra. Berra often gets recognized as having earned the most rings as a player. But with Grissetti earning a total of 17 rings, it makes him having the most World Series rings ever in Major League history. He was said to be the perfect coach, in, in quotations, uh, because he had no ambition whatsoever to manage 
turning down numerous offers over the years to do so. <laughs> so in 1969, Crosetti joined the expansion Seattle Pilots in their inaugural year. And if you know anything about the Seattle Pilots, you'd know that that obviously didn't last long. And he later moved to the Minnesota Twins organization. Frank Cassetti uh, died at the age of 91 in two, uh, 2002. He was the last surviving member of the 1932, the 1936, the 1937, and the 1939 World Series champion, New York Yankees. Let's take a look at the card. So the back of the card is a blue back. It's uh, got a 1936 on it, and it shows the, um, the stats for 1935. And um, the back of the card talks about Frank uh, Cressetti and Tony Lazari forming the all-Italian keystone combination for the Yankees, a double play team equaled only by Detroit's uh, Rogel Geringer duo. Now let's talk about the front of the card, one that I, I happen to like quite a bit. Um, there's some speculation going on about the front of this card, so let's bring it in for uh, a zoom. So you got Frank in the foreground, and he's in the back swing of his of his bat or his swing. Uh, you've got a, a catcher right here. It's kind of interesting. I, you know, I love the addition of a catcher in a card. Here's where the speculation comes in. You've got two players right here. One is walking up to the plate, and the other is sitting in the dugout. Now it's speculation that this would be um, Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth. Uh, being that, you know, they, they don't have cards in this set. Um, this picture was supposedly taken before the 1936 season, probably before the 1935 season. And I'm sure as most of you vintage um, collectors know, you know, Babe Ruth wasn't even playing in, in 36. So um, again, it, it's speculation, but uh, it adds an interesting touch to the, the lore of this card. So I really do like the front of this card as well. All right, and then let's talk about the last card, wrapping up this video. That's card number 87 of Steve O'Neill. So let's get him in there. All right, Steve O'Neill. Um, and the card misspells his name, by the way. That's Steve, or that's O'Neill spelled O apostrophe N E I double L. And the card says his name. O apostrophe N E I L. Anyway, uh, he was born in 1891 in Manuka, Pennsylvania. He made his major league debut in 1911 as a catcher for the Cleveland Naps. Um, and um, Steve O'Neill had three brothers who all played in the major leagues. His older brothers, Jack, who was a catcher, and Mike, who was a pitcher, would become the first brothers, uh, brother battery in major league history. Steve's younger brother, Jim, played for the Washington Senators from 1920 to 1923. Steve would end up having the most successful playing career of the O'Neill brothers, serving as a catcher for 17 years in the American League. Uh, in 1920, his teammate Ray Chapman was struck in the head by a pitch and died. Steve O'Neill fainted when he saw, when he saw uh, Ray Chapman's body in the casket. The Indians would go on to win the 1920 World Series over the Brooklyn Robins, devoting the victory to Chapman's honor. In 1924, Steve O'Neill was traded to the Boston Red Sox, only to be traded once again in 1925, this time to the New York Yankees. He spent the 1926 season in the minor leagues, and in 1927 he was called back up to the majors, this time by the St. Louis Browns. He would retire as a player at the end of the 1928 season. After his playing days ended, Steve became a manager for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He continued to manage minor league teams until he was called to manage the Cleveland Indians in 1935. So notice he had a gap there between his playing days in the majors and his coaching or managing days in the majors. Um, in addition to the Indians, Steve would go on to manage the Tigers, the Red Sox, and the Phillies. In 1945, he led the Detroit Tigers to a World Series championship over the Chicago Cubs. His last year as a manager was in 1954 while he managed the Phillies. And then Steve O'Neill died in 1962. So let's talk briefly about this card. Now the back of the card, you know, the back of this card is the only card in the set 
that doesn't show where he was born or give any statistics. And and here's why. This is the only card in the whole set uh, of a manager. The only card in the entire 1934 to 36 Diamond Stars that represents a manager only. So uh, the back of the card talks about Steve O'Neill being counted on to leave the Indian lead the Indians into the thick of the 1936 pennant hunt against the Tigers, Red Sox, and Yankees. Well, if you don't know, the Indians finished fifth in the American League with a record of 80 and 74 that year. The Yankees would go on to win the World Series that year. Let's talk about the front. So uh, the front of this card is is quite interesting. I do like it. It's um, of Steve O'Neill. You know, obviously he's coaching batting at the time, um, and he's in a follow-up swing uh, of his bat. In the background, you see some foliage, though. You see some trees. And this might be one of the very few, if the only card that actually has foliage in it. Um, you've got a blue sky, and the, and the grandstands are red. And, um, you know, just a lot of neat colors and just some interesting stuff. What I think is the coolest thing is that it's the only card that represents a manager in the whole set. Anyway, so that is Steve, o Steve O'Neill. And um, while I fumble this around, I just want to tell everybody thank you for watching. I appreciate your time. Keep hunting the good stuff. And until next episode, take care.